Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And it's I think it's a either a point of contention or it hasn't really been sussed out whether these periods of fast would lead to lean tissue loss over time, which would be as particularly if you're thinking of health span and lifespan and over time, if you want to implement, we can probably get into this, you know, when, how often would you implement, say, a one week fast or intermittent fasting and, and things like that. But if you were to do, say, let's say like a week long fast twice a year or once a quarter, whatever the, whatever the case may be, if you lost a significant amount of lean mass and over time you're aging, and I don't want to just say that like when you get older, there's sarcopenia, but if you're each time you're going through this fasting period, there might be some benefit. But if you were to take a hit on your lean tissue sort of consistently over time and you're, that would be something that you, you know, you want to sort of jealously preserve is all that lean mass. So that would be one of the, you know, potential contraindications of doing frequent fasts. Yet, if you if you can preserve that lean tissue, I think that would be it would be super important to to understand and find out. And I I think a lot of times when you look at the studies like Cahill studies, I the subjects it's a different population, but I also think that they're not engaging in a lot of you know weight bearing activity, and just from you know, the literature, even on, say, low calorie diets or high protein, low calorie diets, when people do those types of, whether it's calorie restriction or dietary restriction, and they engage in a weight bearing exercise program, they're lifting weights, they tend to preserve a lot more lean tissue. That's probably outside of eating protein. Actually, probably number one is weight training is probably the best way to either add lean mass or preserve it. And then maybe protein intake itself is, is second. Yeah, I I totally agree with this. And I think this is a great example of selective mTOR inhibition. In an ideal world, you don't really want to turn off mTOR in the muscle. I mean, you don't want it on every minute of every day or you'll get muscular dystrophy. But the far bigger issue as we age is mTOR activity going down in the muscle. That's what's leading to sarcopenia. Where I really wanted mTOR to go down for that week was in my liver, in my fat cells, probably in my, you know, myocardial cells and other places like that. But when it came to skeletal muscle, you know, you're exactly right. I think that that's the week you double down on what you're doing in the weight room. If anything, you go out of your way to make sure you send that signal to the muscle. Hey, dude, no shrinking allowed. Um, Now, that said, when you did your week, what happened to your muscle mass? Even if you didn't take the goofy selfies, did you just have a sort of subjective sense of what happened? Yeah, I mean, I was... Way trading, I think, the entire time. Because and- to be to be clear for the listener, you have a hell of a lot more muscle mass than I do. So that if there's going to be a difference, you are going to see it even more amplified. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've lost all that much. Might have lost a little bit. I was definitely engaging in weight training. I had a, um, I have like a Tanita bioimpedance scale, and I do remember just in terms of, you know, taking out the lean tissue and lean tissue, the fat-free mass and the fat mass, it didn't look like, at least on the scale, although that's heavily weighted with uh, your hydration and water status. So I don't know how consistent I was when I was doing it. It didn't seem like I lost all that much lean tissue. And I always think like if I were to do these experiments that I might be different than other people, but the one thing like I don't want to do is just stop exercising. I think it'd be really hard for me to do like a week-long fast and not exercise, but it would be I would suspect that you might lose more lean tissue that way. Completely speculative, but I didn't. And there was no similarly, but I don't think that I was doing what you do with those Peloton workouts. I think you were talking about cadence. I was going to follow up and ask you if that gives you watts as well. And you can kind of see like what your average power was. No, no, my wattage was decimated. So I normally ride in power zones. So Peloton now allows you to see your zone. So there's seven zones. It's like the uh, Andrew Kogan is a bike you know physiologist who's created the system and Matt Wilpers who's my favorite Peloton instructor he does all of his classes as power zones so I know exactly what zone one two three four five six and seven are and every workout we do is congruent with that well I even going into this said don't set reset your expectations you will do a discount of one zone so if you're doing a zone if you're doing a workout where you're going you know 
two minutes of zone three, two minutes of zone four, one minute of zone five, repeat, I would just do it all minus one. And even doing that, I could not keep up. So in other words, relative to my former self, I was at least 60, if not 80 watts less capable. Uh, there was just no denying it. So there was, you know, just a fraction of the ability to put out power on a bicycle. And that might just suggest two different types of demands on the muscle. You know, if you're doing a squat or a row or a deadlift, that's different. That's much harder. It's much, you're asking much more of the sarcomere than if you're riding a bike per contraction. But on the bike, you're asking for many, many, many more of those contractions. And there, there was just something that I couldn't do on the latter that I seemed to have no difficulty doing on the former.